Well, good morning, Pine Grove. Man, it feels like I haven't been up here for a long time. So it's always a joy. It's always a joy to be up uh, sharing the message with you. And uh, I've uh, had a little bit more time this week. I'm not sure it's going to show in the preparation for the message, but I've had a bit more time. Whoops. A bit more time this week to, uh, to prepare the message. I uh, was thinking that I was a COVID warrior. COVID would not touch me, but I was wrong. And uh, about 10 days ago, had a horrible sleep, woke up, tested, positive. So you have to cancel everything. But life is amazingly cancelable. And so I sort of thought, wow, the world is not about me. What a stark revelation. And so, you know, you cancel the pool party and you can reschedule it. And you cancel your doctor's appointments and you can reschedule them. And you cancel your trips to see friends and you can reschedule them. So it was a really, really good time to kind of get into the Bible and sort of say, hey, maybe I should do some, uh, some deep thinking for my message this morning. Well, I went into the Proverbs that I had picked probably three months ago and thought, well, that's not very deep. I really messed that up. Now I've got a whole week and I've got four lines out of the Bible. So what, Monday, line one, Tuesday, line two, well, it turns out that God just has this funny way sometimes of saying, you know, Don, you should just chill. Slow down. Listen to me. And so, this message that I was going to talk about, you know, this huge character building and transformation uh, out of this uh, passage in Proverbs, it's kind of going to be that message, but it's also kind of going to be about what God spoke to me about this week. So, fasten your seatbelts. We're going to build a Jesus house today. And this uh, would be helpful if we had a knowledgeable carpenter, which we do, um, if we were building it out of wood. But I think we all are apprentice carpenters as we build this house of Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of think that everybody in their mind's eye has a dream house. And, you know, it depends the kind of person you are. And uh, for some strange reason, the last six months, I've been reading a lot of biographies. Uh, I've been reading, you know, biographies of rock stars and biographies of missionaries. And, and, and everybody has a sense of, of what it would be like to arrive, to have that place of their own. And, you know, for you, it might be this little cottage in the woods. You know, is that the kind of person you are? That you want everything kind of nice and tidy with the little cracks filled with just the right amount of, of white caulking, but you want to have the stone fireplace that goes up with the chimney, but you want it in a place that's private. You want to have your own space. You want to have it so that it feels comfortable, but you realize that you're part of something bigger, something like nature. Or maybe your sense is, I want to be a little bit more regal. Uh, my dream home is a 19th century Victorian mansion. I'd like a lot of property. I'd like a few servants. Uh, and that would just basically make my day. That's my dream home. Although this one, with just a little bit of uh, artistic decor change could turn into a haunted house. No, that's not my first choice. Now, maybe you're kind of the, the cowboy style. I'm speaking to me. Maybe I'm speaking, I don't know, to Wes. Uh, you really want that sprawling ranch style house. The few mountains in the background, that's kind of handy. And uh, a couple of horses in the back. And um, that would be my dream house. Or 
maybe you have been reading not biographies but sci-fi and you want a sci-fi house with lots of geodesic domes and windows and the ultimate ecological futuristic house that's going to take you into the next century, perhaps millennium if you get cyber froze or whatever they do. And then finally, maybe you're just kind of way out there and you want this as your dream house. A uh, little bit off, a little bit kind of um, futuristic, uh, one that probably Ron would rightly say, I don't want to be involved. Just too many curves, too many weird things. But the idea of a dream house is not a concept that is foreign to any of us. We all have an idea that, you know, if, if just we had the means or the time or the property, we could have that place that was truly us, could express who we are, it could be a place of comfort, it could be a place of identity, and it's not a long stretch. If you ask anybody what their dream house is, that they'll have an answer. So I think when we look at our text today, I want you to think about your dream house. What is your spiritual dream house? Because this is the great thing about Proverbs, is that they're very pithy, and they're very real, and they're very tangible, and they're almost smelly sometimes. And yet they have a deeper spiritual purpose that we try to take the layers away from to understand it. So here's our passage. Put it in, up there in three different versions. It's actually very, very similar in the three versions. Actually, two languages, three versions. So there's, there's doesn't seem even in, in the, the Hebrew that there's much controversy as to what the language of the proverb is actually says. What it means, that might be another story, but what it says is pretty consistent. By wisdom, a house is built, and through understanding, it is established. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Kind of like a dream home. Or in the message, it takes wisdom to build a house and understanding to set it on a firm foundation. It takes knowledge to furnish its rooms with fine furniture and beautiful draperies. And then in, uh, en français, c'est par la sagesse qu'on construit une maison et par L'intelligence qu'on la rende solide. C'est grâce au savoir que les chambres se remplissent de toutes sortes de biens précieux et agréables. So, there's a bunch of things that are going on in this proverb. There's, I've underlined the kind of the three key words uh, when, you, when you first jump into this. So, um, Monday, by wisdom, a house is built. Tuesday, and through understanding, it is established. Wednesday, through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasure. Well, there was my homework. Okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I figured, you know, I'd learn something about wisdom, I'd learn something about understanding, I'd learn something about knowledge, and then I would tell you about it. It didn't work that way. I sort of thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe there's some, there's some key, like the dictionary, or maybe there's so, some code that I could, I could use to break down what, you know, wisdom meant, and building, and understanding, and establishing, and knowledge, and filling rooms up with all kinds of treasures. But instead of that, here's what I got. Uh, God said, maybe you should just go a little bigger. Like, don't get totally messed up with the words. Maybe think about what I'm trying to do. The Bible is a love letter from the Lord to his people. And you know, if you sometimes get a letter and you just dwell on one word, you kind of get the wrong message. 
So I thought, okay, maybe, maybe I should go back. Go big or go home. I was already home, so I had to go big. Why do I love the Proverbs? Why does God write the Proverbs? Why does he impart to humans this function of writing the Proverbs and then interpreting the Proverbs? Well, I, I, the first thing that came to me, <laughs> which was pretty simple, was they're very simple. You don't have to be a uh, nuclear scientist uh, or a you know, five-star chef or a uh, fighter pilot to read them and understand them. Well, to read them. They're written in pretty simple words, and they're really, really amazing because they're accessible. At the same time, as I learned on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, they're incredibly complicated. They're complex, and they're written almost like an escape room code. Has anybody ever done any escape rooms? Okay. So you go into the escape room, and it's, it, they write down the, 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 the clues, and you're like, well, yeah, the box is gray. You're like, the box is gray. What, 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 what does that possibly mean? And so they're, on the one hand, they're very simple, and they're very complex. And so the Proverbs are almost like a game. God's way of saying, come to me and play. Come to me and try to understand this life lesson from this very, very simple set of words. I guess the second thing that was really kind of a shock, shouldn't have been, um, was that they were written a very long time ago, and they had an application and they had a decoding in 1500 BC, but they have an equal opportunity decoding now. And you basically have an opportunity to say, oh, how, how does that apply to my life? How do I have knowledge so that I can bring rare treasures into my house? And so, uh, that leads, I guess, to the next point, is that there's so many layers that these Proverbs have. And we're going to just unpack a few of these layers that I think, I I. I hope and I'm, I prayed that it was the Holy Spirit giving me some knowledge as to what the layers of this particular proverb are. And the other thing that was really cool, and this was kind of the last point, was a lot of these uh, proverbs now, if you read a lot of them, and I know we've been kind of doing our homework in proverbs this summer, they kind of go counterculture now. In the 21st century, there's a lot of stuff in there you're like, oh! <gasps> The Bible's going to be canceled. It's just so countercultural. And I think God is saying, you know, this was truth then, it's truth now, and it will be truth forever. So that was kind of God take me out to 39,000 feet and looking down on the Proverbs. And then I spent a bit of time and said, well, how about this one, God? What, what, what is in this one and he says, you know what? <laughs> I really like the building metaphor. I know you're an agricultural guy, Don, but there are other ways to think about the Bible. And when we talk about building, you're talking about the kind of kingdom metaphor that I have in mind. So it was interesting how often we do talk about building. Ron was talking about being called to the house of the Lord this morning. Well, the house of the Lord is built. It's built by his community. It's built by his followers. It was Jesus' disciples were his house. Um, and it's very interesting how often the building metaphor is used in other places in the Bible, and we're going to come to that in just a minute. But I was also struck by the, the power of this proverb in its use of these three very interesting words that are quite common words, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And if you ask yourself, you say, oh, I know what those mean. I, I, know, I, know, I know wisdom. I mean, I know knowledge. I know understanding. But do you? Do you know what is wise? Do you know what knowledge is? Do you know what understanding is? And I think God is giving us this really kind of cute puzzle to try to put some flesh on the bones as to what that means 
when you're in a relationship with him. And then finally, um, the house is, is, as I said, with the dream home, it's a good, safe, comfortable place. We, we feel comfortable. Oh, come over to my haunted house. We don't usually say that. You know, we say the house, come to my house. Come to a pool party at my house. And um, that's a good thing. That's a safe thing. That's a comforting place to be. So it's just a really interesting metaphoric package that God is offering us. So let's go in and take a look at some house building passages. These are all fairly well known. If you've been a Christian for a while and you've read the Bible a bit, these are not going to be surprises. Hebrews, don't know who the author was, but um, for every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. The whole building metaphor and how important it is for God to take us on that building process. And then Psalm 127, which is attributed to Solomon, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. And this one's going to be pretty much um, in the same way of thinking as our proverb. And then perhaps, I guess, the most famous of all, uh, lots of songs written about this, uh, lots of sermons have been preached on this. Uh, I think probably it might be Ron's code of ethics when he builds, don't build anything on sand. As far as I know, that's kind of the rule. Therefore, everyone who hears the words of mine Jesus speaking here, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Then the rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand, and the rains came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell in a great crash. So it's interesting that Jesus speaks in building metaphors. The proverb that we're looking at speaks in a building metaphor, and Solomon in the Psalms speaks of the building metaphor, and there's many, many, many more um, metaphors in the Bible with respect to building. But it's important not to get lost in the metaphor, but to kind of peel back the onion and think about what God might be talking to us this morning about building. So, a couple of contrasts, just so that we can kind of get the, the building metaphor uh, out developed as much as we can, and then we're going to try to apply it to uh, our spiritual house that we're building. What's a, well bu- what's a well-built house? What's good building? Well, um, good building gives you a well-built house built on rock. It's solid. It's beautiful. I mean, you've got to admit, all of those dream homes, they were all beautiful in their own bizarre, peculiar kind of way. Um, and and uh, the, the proverb says it will be filled with beautiful and and rare uh, goods and furniture. It's lasting, so there's a certain kind of of, uh, longevity to it, a certain sense of, I can can relax. It's impervious to storms, and it's a home, um, a sanctuary, a place where um, you uh, go to be safe. And, you know, any lawyers in the room, there's... uh, grand legal tradition that a man's and woman's house is their castle. And what that means in legal terms is you need a search warrant if you want to search somebody's house. But even if you're the former president of the United States, doesn't mean they can't come into your house. It's been a bad week. Anyway, um, but a home is a sanctuary, and there's a recognition that, that there's some safety, there's some comfort. You can be who you are. Well, how about a poorly built house? Usually, uh, we're talking bad building results in a poorly built house. It's a source of stress. It's a money pit. Uh, There's always something that needs to be fixed. It can be dangerous to live in it. And it's a threat to the rest of your life. 
It's not a sanctuary. It's not a happy place. It's not a, it's not a place where you can just be who you are. It's a place of conflict. If you're not in conflict with the people living in it, you're in conflict with the house itself, as if it had a personality. So let's move kind of away from the housing metaphor. But why is it really important, sorry, move away from the physical house metaphor to the more spiritual house metaphor? Why is the house building metaphor so appealing that Jesus would use it, that God would use it, that Solomon would use it, that all of these people in the Bible would have us think about our spiritual life as building a house? Well, it, it covers this basic human need of security, uh, basic hu uh, of protection, uh, focus of your identity, but also, interestingly, your house is also a locus for community. If any of you are in a house group, it's not called, you know, uh, it, it's not called the house group because we want to exclude people. We want them to feel like they're part of a community. And so that house-building metaphor is important not just on an individual basis, but I think God is saying it's important as a community thing. Building a house, it's exciting. Anybody's built a new house? I don't know. I've never built a new house. I think it might be overwhelming. But um, there's just a sense of new beginnings, unlimited potential, evolution into your dream home. And it's a relationship. It's a, it's a sense of an ongoing thing, not one and done. So, is this proverb a cautionary tale? Can house building go badly? Let me count the ways. So what is the deeper meaning that our passage might be getting at? Well, I think there, there are some differences between good, uh, good, uh, good building and bad building that maybe is underlying some of the words. I mean, the words are, by wisdom, a house is built. Doesn't say what happens when you don't use wisdom. Uh, through understanding, it is established. If you have no understanding, is it not established? Does it fall down around your ears? Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Does that mean you have really awful, stinky stuff if you don't? use knowledge? Well, maybe. So what I'm saying is, there's a, a very, it's a very positive proverb, but the, the bad building analogy is just under the surface. What's the difference between building a house when you plan it versus when you don't plan it? I don't need architectural drawings. It'll, I'll just wing it. I've got a skill saw and a couple of hammers, and what could possibly go wrong? Um, well, difference between good and, and dangerous construction. The idea that I probably only need one tool. Uh, you know, I mean, a saw, I could use a saw as a hammer because it's quite heavy, and um, that would perhaps result in something quite dangerous. And then the whole idea of, you know, uh, basically, if I get a reputable builder in to build my house, I'm done after that. I don't really have to do any maintenance. And you know what? It'll still be full of rare and beautiful treasures. Windows will never get dirty. Windows will never have to be replaced. Foundations will never have cracks in it, and there will be no sewer backup ever. Wish I could get one of those in policies. So, I think our proverb suggests that if we move from the physical building, which we have all had a lot of experience with, to the spiritual building, which is harder to put our finger on, there's kind of three things going on. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. I don't know what those mean. I tried. I really did want to have an answer for you. I thought, hey, knowledge is good. Understanding is better. Wisdom is best. Done. Uh, it's, it's not that. Uh, I sort of thought, well, knowledge is getting the right information, reading the right books, figuring out, you know, what the perfect concrete mixture is when you lay cement. I mean, if I read enough books, I could figure out how to do that. 
But I don't think that's what God says is going to give you the answer to building a strong spiritual house. There's something more. There's something about understanding what you're reading. I remember uh, that passage where it's Philip, I think, is by the, the eunuch. And the eunuch is reading Isaiah. And Isaiah says, um, he's reading out loud. And Philip says, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And um, Philip says, well, how could I understand what I'm reading? Uh, I need somebody to explain it to me. And so that comprehension is, is somehow deeper than just self-learning. It's about getting a sense from others as to what is the message. How does this work? How does a plumbing system interact with an electrical system? If you do it badly, it, it really does go badly. How does my system of the way I treat a um, service provider work with my Sunday morning spiritual life? Well, sometimes we need help from fellow Christians, pastors, uh, who can tell us that. And then finally, wisdom. I think this is, this is where <laughs> it really becomes clear that if you try to build the house by yourself, it's not going to work. Wisdom takes it to the next level and says, God, you take the wheel. I can't do this. I don't understand. I don't have enough knowledge. I don't have enough understanding. I need wisdom, and the wisdom can only come from you. And so what we have is by wisdom a house is built. That is a reference in my mind directly to him engaging God in my spiritual house building. Because if I just rely on the understanding... It may be established, but it won't be God-breathed. If I just rely on my own knowledge, I will not. I will not have much more than a museum piece with rare and beautiful treasures, but not really something that is a sanctuary. So, <laughs> peeling back one more layer of the onion, what is this proverb all about in my mind? Well, I think there's a bigger message here that building a good house has to be on many levels. And the levels, it's having a right relationship with God at the very beginning. That is how we do the wise building. That is how we get the wise um, choices. And listening to him. We're going to come in just a second about how we might be able to do that. But it's not only that. It also funnels down into some of these other relationships it, that our spiritual health will reflect on if we have a good house. If we have a bad house, it won't reflect very well. But it's also going to be our relationship with our spouse, with our parents, with our family, with our church family. And if we have an ability to Approach God for wisdom, for my spiritual health. Approach right relationships with my family, my spouse. And then I'm going to add a third one, right relationships with my creation. It's so essential. God is breathing all of this into your spiritual house, if you're ready to listen. So, that's nice, Don. How do you do that? So let's, let's, let's start on a home reno. I mean, personally, I've got a lot of work. It's uh, foundations falling, siding's coming off. Luckily, Janet just washed the windows of our house, so I don't have to worry about the windows for right now. But all kinds of other things are things that are going to have to be done. And so, uh, you know, I don't think there's necessarily an order, wisdom, um, understanding, knowledge. You, you you might say there's an order. Wisdom is kind of the highest order to, to get started on. But I think you need all three. And wisdom is knowing the first part of a home reno of yourself is that you can't build a good house on your own. As much as you try self-help, yeah, it was, it was interesting. I was reading a, a joke the other day that said, uh, if it's self-help, why do we have to do it in groups? I don't know. Anyway, um, 
But you can't, you can't do a home reno, a spiritual home reno, without calling on God. And this is where um, the message from last week, Marjorie's message, I think is so amazing because it fit perfectly in with this. Understanding is not only ask, like wisdom is asking Jesus to help, asking God to come into your life for the, for the reno. But the understanding is to know that we have to embrace a renovation. We have to want a renovation. You know, I want to uh, get people to listen to Healthy Hearts by Marjorie last week because she said, look, if your heart's got plaque in it and you have unconfessed sin, and, and it's just going to be really hard to start the project. And you really have to take a look and say, I, I, I want this. And you do have to do a little analysis. And um, Janet and I have been reading this book called Renovation of the Heart. Dallas Willard, uh, it's 20 years old. But guess what? It speaks to you as if it was written last week about how you need to take a look at your heart, how you need to take a look at your soul, how you need to take a look at your will, um, like not your will, like the legal document, but your willpower. How you have to take a look at your body and say, these are, these are like electrical systems and plumbing systems and, and uh, two by fours. If, if you don't take a look at that and start that renovation, it's going to start to decay. And maybe it's already decayed quite a bit, but you have to have an understanding that this is going to be important. And then finally, uh, knowledge. And, and I think the knowledge part is what you can do as a, an individual, what we can do is we can stand on the shoulders of our Christian uh, brothers and sisters from the past, and we can stand on, on Christ's promise that we do have tools and we do have materials. Fasting, prayer, sc reading scripture, relying on community to take on uh, a more Christ-like character. One verse. So there, there is sort of a process, this wisdom thing. It's not like you can go buy a book of wisdom. Um, but you can act on some of the knowledge that has come from our past, from Christian brothers and sisters. So finally, um, when my good house pops up, uh, I'm... I, I, I'm hoping it is popping up, but hypothetically even, if it could pop up, my relationships, what would be the benefits? My relationship would, it would improve with God. My relationship would improve with spouse, parents, and, and uh, family, with community, with creation. And it's really um, about building a life and asking God to be that builder, that craftsman, that overseer, that architect to make my life Solid, beautiful, lasting, impervious to storms, and the promise of an eternal home. By wisdom, a house is built, and through understanding, it is established. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. I want to build my life, my spiritual house, that way. And in a little tiny vote of camaraderie for our canoeing buddies, I want to finish off with a song. Are we okay with the song, Paul? Yep. Finish off with a song that's called Build My Life. And it doesn't have a single house in it, sorry. But it does have some amazing canoeing uh, rivers. So work with me here. Um, wisdom is inviting Jesus to be the general contractor of my house, my life. We're going to listen to Build My Life. But.